Okay, welcome to this session. So we'll take the five first five minutes maybe in settling our mind, getting our thoughts from outside or inside distractions, bringing the mind to the here and now at this present moment. anchoring the mind to any particular object, sensation, breath, whatever works for you to settle the mind. and to set the right mental tone for this session. Be it for the speaker or to those who are listening to it. Those who are new to meditation, if there are some among you, but will those listening online, it will be good to focus on your breath by first bringing the breath to a natural flow, taking your time and slowing it down to come to a natural flow, natural rhythm, and let the mind just follow it. If it helps, you could even count the breath up to five, ten, whatever works for you. And then eventually let go of the counting. Just follow the breath. And eventually even let go of the following the breath but rather meeting it at the entrance of the nostril every time it comes in and goes out. Welcome everyone, by way of setting the motivation, let's recall the fact that great compassion that we all aspire to generate within ourselves requires two essential factors, one that of seeing the kindness of others. And here, seeing the kindness means how we are always benefited by them, the benefits we generate, we get, we receive from others. If possible, to see every sentient being without exception in the light of being 
a benefactor, one way or the other, almost constantly, and more particularly when we are born in realms which require the care, the constant care, and nurturing support of our mother. Likewise, those near dear ones, including father, brothers, sisters, etc. In a way, we could also see how even within one particular life, we can see how many numerous, innumerable people, beings, sentient beings, even including insects, are in one way or the other, directly or indirectly, affecting us, supporting us, and we depend on them for our very survival and for our successes in the endeavors that we care for, that we are engaged in, particularly when one is trying to make the most of his life in matters related to taming the mind, then without having to speak of past lives, numerous past lives and future lives, just taking into account this very sing singular life, this very present life, we can see how so many of sentient beings, known to us, not known to us, benefit us. When my thought goes to the time when we were in the thick of the pandemic, everyone was waiting for the good news of a vaccine developed and see how the efforts of so many people totally unknown to us from everywhere around the world, be that through their own actual action, be that through their support, inspiration, etc., have contributed to the possibility of having a vaccine, how it has led us to some level of security. Likewise, in so many other ways, other regular ways, without having to necessarily wait for specific, special, tragic times like this. On our daily basis, in this single lifetime, we benefit and depend on so many people, far and wide. Many of the vaccines, many of the preventive measures that we take, those are all results of so many people far and wide. And their assistants, their friends, their parents, their parents' parents, are all in one way or the other are connected to how we became the recipient of that benefit. And when we extend it into past and future lives, it's quite clear how not a single sentient being could be left out from that category of beings who have benefited us. Not just benefited us, but benefited us. Almost constantly, you could say, one way or one way or the other, directly or indirectly. It 
It's a matter of contemplating this fact of our dependency, utter dependency on others. And that other far extend the small circle of known friends and dear ones and dear ones. And in some cases, very clearly, even the animals are involved. It's a matter of contemplating this on a daily basis, not forgetting this. That would naturally give rise to a sense of gratitude. And that leads to a sense of endearment towards them. Which is very, very crucial in the development of a genuine loving kindness. When we feel endeared towards them, when they are endearing to us, and whenever we see them in a condition of distress, misery, suffering, what not, the deeper that we think of, the more concerned genuinely we become. And that naturally gives rise to, I wish I could do something. May they be free from this one way or the other. And eventually we rise up to even shouldering, ready to shoulder the responsibility to be of any service to relieve them of their suffering. But in case of feeling very concerned about their suffering, that too, not just of these superficial sufferings, the sufferings on the surface, namely the suffering of pain, if we want to go deeper into the suffering of, or rather the painfulness of change, and more deeper into the painfulness of being caught in this bondage, to afflictions and karma. When it comes to seeing them in the light of such sufferings, first and foremost, one should generate a sim similar sense of being in a situation like this and develop a sense of disenchantment with it wish to be freed from it. So in this light, I would like all of us to contemplate what Tsongkhapa says in the three principal aspects of the path. To see this being the truth on oneself and contemplate for a while and we move, we shift to others and contemplate the same. So swept by the current of the four powerful rivers tied by the strong bonds of karma which are so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self-grasping egoism, completely enveloped by the darkness of ignorance. Born and reborn in boundless cyclic existence unceasingly tormented by the three sufferings, by contemplating yourself, oneself in this condition, generate a sense of being concerned and the determination to be free from it.
the more sincere, the more genuine the concern we can generate over ourselves along these lines of our wretched condition in samsara. As much sense of genuine concern we could generate over others and feel even more strongly concerned when we couple it with our understanding and appreciation of our indebtedness to them. Let's once again do this contemplation, this time with others in mind, seeing them in these situations. Swept by the current with four powerful rivers, <coughs> tied by the strong bonds of karma, which are so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self grasping egoism, completely enveloped by the darkness of ignorance. Born and reborn in boundless psychic existence. Unceasingly tormented by the three sufferings. Contemplating of all one's mother sentient beings in this situation. Generate this sense of concern over their condition and naturally develop this wish for them to be freed from suffering. Let this genuine wish for them to be freed from suffering grow stronger, further, and transform into this sense of resolve that I will do my best in making this happen towards this end to do a complete full job anything short of attaining full awakening is not going to work So may I attain full awakening solely for the sake of others so that I could be truly capable of showing them unfailing path, unfailing methods by which they could be read from their suffering once forever. Towards that end, we are going to share some Dharma and let's try our best to sustain this motivation through the session, be that while we are speaking or listening or contemplating or discussing Okay, so <coughs> once again, welcome and to this evening of samsara, nirvana, and Buddha nature. <laughs> we are in a samsara, undoubtedly. And if we don't want to be in samsara, that means we aspire for nirvana. And that aspiration is not an empty aspiration because we have not just 
nirvana nature, but Buddha nature. <laughs> In a way, it is so important to always remember of one's Buddha potential, Buddha nature. It is on this very basis that some orders of Tibetan Buddhism go to the extent of even saying that we are already Buddhas, or we have Buddhas within us. All it needs to be done is just pull the veil away, <laughs> unveil it. Whereas from a Buddhist, from a Gelug, hard nose point of view. <laughs> we wouldn't quite say that you are already Buddha, or you have a Buddha within you, at least within the Sutra level, or even in the Tantra level. We wouldn't say that you are quite Buddha, or we are already Buddha. How can Buddha be suffering? But at the same time, we have to also really very seriously consider the, the notion of the possibility of being fully awakened. What, because it has to also work on the basis of causes and conditions. It cannot be just be given or handed down by anyone. Nobody holds that for you. Nobody holds that right for you. Uh, I'm reminded of a, a statement in one of the works of uh, Nagabodhi, Lubin Lujang, Ajari Nagabodhi, where he says, Changchu Sui Jang, Chi Man Yi Sui Jang Ni Su Man Yi, Rang Simi Yong Su Xie Ba Na Tila San Ji San Ji Chi. Buddhahood, your Buddhahood is not going to be bestowed to you or granted to you by anyone, nor it is held by anyone. By knowing, by thoroughly knowing your mind, that's what be fully awake, becoming fully awakened means. Now, it's not that simple, it's just merely knowing. It says, Yongsu, Rangsim Yongsu Shepana, thoroughly. And then in, the, in some Tibetan context, Sheba, Topa, doesn't mean as it ordinarily is translated as understanding, knowing, but rather fully realizing. And here realizing also, even in English context, it is used different ways, but here realizing, becoming, being, becoming real, not understanding, but becoming real. When the mind's full potential becomes completely awakened, completely uh, reaches its full, uh, full potential. Uh, when its full potential is completely realized, becoming real, that's Buddhahood. It's not that far away. It's, it's, yeah, that's the context when he's only sometimes saying, it is hard to practice, but at the same time, in one way, it is very easy. It's, it's just here, here within us that we have to work on. And it's workable, except we need to know where we are and, and put in the right amount of effort. And then keep on giving on. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's in line with causality, making, cultivating causes and conditions, and thus the, the results can be naturally expected. When the causes and conditions come together, no power in the world can stop it from giving rise to its result. And that is speaking not just, that's speaking of the immediate, when the causes and conditions required are completely uh, present. Then the next moment, we are usually speaking of the 
immediate causes and conditions, when one has reached a stage where all the causes and conditions with the potential of immediately giving rise to the result have, or the causes and conditions have ripened to the point of now, just on the verge of giving rise to the aspired goal, nothing, no power in the world can ever stop it from giving rise to that result. So likewise, we have to be able to make sense of the possi this possibility of becoming fully awakened. So even in the, even in the parlance of those schools who speak of ourselves being actually Buddha or we have a Buddha within us, this, they use this term, yesang majena joksang nige. You heard this, right? Yesang majena joksang nige. If you have not, if you are not already Buddha, then there is no way you can be ever Buddha later on. One way of putting it. Which means to say that if the mind is in such a condition that its nature is not defiled at all and pure in that sense from beginningless time, then that is the potential ground upon which you can realize a state of being freed from all the afflictions. Because the afflictions, how may, however strong they may be, they would be only uh, merely adventitious because they would not have ever entered into the city of mind, <laughs> into the heart of mind. They are only on the periphery. They could be driven away. So, so this part about luminosity of the mind, that it is clear, luminous and knowing in nature, Luminous in the sense that its very nature is its very nature, core nature is uncompromised, unafflicted. So knowing this, understanding this, making sense of this, and having experience of this is very crucial. Although as we all agree the question about where the mind comes is it does it have a beginning or not those are part of questions which could be left off to a later time but this luminosity nature of mind has to be something that we need to be able to testify to ourselves okay. so there could be several ways of doing it gross ways with more subtle ways what not the simplest way is usually what we say, that we are not angry every time, we are not jealous every time. There are occasions when we feel completely at ease uh, with ourselves, at peace with ourselves, with the mind, body, almost in a complete state of full balance. <laughs> have, you, have you all experienced such occasions? Yes? I recall very clearly when I was on tour uh, with monks. We were in a 12-seater van. And my place is the shotgun. <laughs> that means the shotgun. That means sit, sitting beside the driver. Because I would also have to help in navigating. Because at that time, they, they, they didn't have the GPS. You have to <laughs> open up the map and then read, okay, next is this, this is this, yeah. At the same time, while being in the short gun, I did the rough translation of the power of compassion by His Holiness. With pencil contributed by someone, notebook contributed by someone, and some donations already chipped in. So that's how uh, the, that's how the power of compassion in Tibetan took birth. <laughs> On the road, while touring. So I very clearly remember, and I thought, 
I didn't think that that was very special, very anything unique, special to me. But at the same time, I very clearly recall a state of being where I cannot complain of anything. Everything was in sync. Mind, body, everything was in sync. There's no way any afflictions could be around. So we do have such experiences, pockets of experiences. Now the question is, how do we own it? How do we uh, gain some control over it? Have a more say, more sense of control, so that we could call it up anytime we can. And that doesn't ask for any special uh, techniques. We have to just work against our afflictions. Those were occasions when we were just lucky that everything fell in place and we happened to recognize it. But that shows that it is possible. The possibility is very much, very much affirmed, confirmed, even by those accidental situations. And then we can deliberately find ourselves in a state of being, even while in the thick of samsara, with the blessings of the teachings of the Buddha, If we make, if we, if we contribute our part of making effort, first beginning with an interest, seeing some truth in it, maybe with intellectually at first, and then even eventually affirming it through one's own practice and experience, and keep with that, keep at that, then yes. Even while in samsara, while having not yet uprooted, let alone uproot or touch the seeds of them, but we could keep them at bay and be able to bring up that state of balance. I, I cannot quote it verbatim, but there is a saying, Milarepa. Even while in being in samsara, there can be ways by which you could generate happiness on a constant level. Even while struggling with the afflictions, dealing with them, but there can be openings that you can create. Those are all indications of the very fact that yes, deep down, the mind is undefiled in its core. It's only what you call, covered by, or affected by adventitious afflictions. An example in this, towards this, is very often given, uh, I think even in the texts, in the scriptures also, is that of gold, which are mined. When they are mined, oh, I've seen videos of people mining for gold, where there are no government restrictions, ha, ah, they spend so much time <laughs> in there, and then all they get is very little, but it requires so much effort. And nonetheless, the goals that they get, however the soils they may be, but those are all temporary soils, you can take, you can extract the pure gold. If naturally gold can be pure in that nature, even in the midst of dirt, why not mind? So contemplating this fundamental, natural gift of mind's essential nature being unpolluted is very realistic at the same time, very essential uh, in giving us the encouragement and also making the case for the possibility of liberation and full awakening. So, picking up from where we left last time, which I 
barely remember. I think at at the bottom of the page twenty one two seven seven, right? Let me uh, once again re quickly read the paragraph. One type of obst obstruction is physical matters. Physical matter. A wall obstructs us from seeing what is beyond it. When the wall is removed, our visual consciousness can see what is there. A second obstruction is distance and the size. The object is too far away or too small for our cognitive faculties to come in contact with this. To some extent, telescopes and microscopes have helped alleviate this difficulty. In these cases, we can know the object not because the mind has become clearer and better able to apprehend the object, but because the object is brought within the range of our operable cognitive faculties. Usually in the Abhidhamma, in the Abhidhamma, since it's uh, identification, it's, uh, yeah, it's identification of what are the obscurations differ from that of the Chittamatras, more particularly of the Pasangikas. This, they speak of these obstructions, these kind of similar obstructions within ourselves due to the fact that things are too far, too subtle, too many, etc., etc. We are not able to see them. And those serve as an obstruction to, be, uh, to, to, to become fully awakened. And they need to be uh, cleared up. So it's not just merely confined to the physical, but even internally we could have obstructions to this effect. And work could be done to uh, alleviate that. A third difficulty concerns the cognitive faculties. That are the basis of consciousness. The visual consciousness is able to perceive only visible forms, not sounds or other sense phenomena, because it is dependent on the eye faculty. If a healthy eye faculty is absent, the visual consciousness cannot perceive visual, visible forms. It's quite intriguing to, again, reflect on the fact that we see physical things with our eyes. But how much of the physical, physical things are we able to see with our eyes? The eye itself is not that fully equipped to see all types of physical, visible forms, of all types of forms. Here it says visible forms, but even from among the entirety of visible forms, uh, we may be seeing only a fraction of it. So anyway, not only the faculties are responsible for seeing their respective objects, but at the same time there could be obstructions to seeing other things or to seeing other, other uh, objects falling within that same, uh, same category. The type of brain a being has also influences what that being can perceive. A mental faculty dependent on an animal brain and one dependent on the human brain have diff different range of objects they can know. Due to the complexity of the brains of these two beings, the mental faculties, consciousnesses, depending on them, differ in what they can perceive and understand. This is more of a general scientific take here, but even in this, with the admission the scientists also, there can be some ex exceptions in this, in this too. There are cases of people with brain mostly filled with water, they call it hydro 
Hydro, hydrocephalic, yeah. But at the same time, being able to not only see things, react to situations, but also show emotions, and having kind of a, a overstayed, overlived the time that they were given by their doctors. There was one that I very clearly remember that I um, shared in the part, as part of my presentation and at one of the Mind and Life conference. That's where I also spoke of. Oh, now it, is, it, it's, it looks like too, too long time ago. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, these are as at, at the best kind of based on regular researches but not comprehensive uh, kind of a case being not on the basis of uh, comprehensive research This makes me think the reason why I'm sounding a little, what do you call, uh, rebellious <laughs> It's because, in the, it's it, partly because I'm biased. Because in the Buddhist text, there's hardly any mention of brain. <laughs> Very little in in the whole of Shantideva's text, there's just once or two, I think. And that has nothing to do with it. it's being connected with <laughs> with the mind and how it is very essential, etc. But saying, oh, someone who has been hurt in on, in the brain, if caring for that is a big deal, then etc. Oh, etc. Et right. So likewise in Tantra also there are there's some very slight mention of brain as in connection with the bliss that is generated and whatnot, but not with consciousness in the way that we the the not uh, the neuroscientists take it to be. Although within the neuroscientists also these days uh, uh, different opinions are springing up and that relationship between brain and mind has uh, gone through many changes but at this very point uh, they're open to downward relation upward relation or simultaneous correlation etc so it's not a given fact <laughs> that mind necessarily comes from the brain and that Whoever has no brain doesn't have mind. And yes, particularly, of course, of course, of course, on uh, on a grosser level. The grosser levels of consciousness, the grosser they are, the more dependent they are with the body. That is accepted by the Buddhists. Body as such, not no particular brain, brain in particular, but body in, as such. The relationship uh, is, what you call, uh, mutual. The dependence is mutual. But the settler of the mind becomes the lesser dependence on the body. And from a Buddhist perspective, at least um, as mentioned in the highest Yoga Tantra, when the 80 Rangshinkyajukundo, 80 what do we call them? Mm -hmm. Indicative. 
80 indicative concept, conceptual thoughts, conceptions. Mm -hmm. Up until up until their dissolution, we could maybe say there's still some connection, but from the connection with the brain, maybe. But from then on, brain would have already stopped. No breathing, heart would have stopped everything. By usual clinical definition, we would have been already dead. But from a Buddhist perspective, consciousness still continues. So that's, and, and, and there are three or four more stages for the mind to remain within the body before leaving it. And during that time, no matter uh, at how long it may take, it may differ with individuals, but unless one is remaining in a tuktam, in a state, in the higher, in the clear light mind, etc., or somewhere in between, it could be fairly short time, two, three days, four days. Nonetheless, there's technically no brain, at least no functioning brain, and no no connection with it. Nonetheless, from Buddhist perspective, we say there is mind, and there are cases of people uh, staying the so-called Tuktam for long, some for months, where the body, instead of uh, decaying, kind of regains its glory back. So, uh, so here, the dependence on the brain has to be understood in context, from even from a Buddhist perspective, not just on the brain, but from, on other or or organs of the body. The dependence of the mind on them, it is only at a gross level of mind, not a certain level of mind. Okay, the type of brain a being has also influenced what that being can perceive. A mental faculty dependent on an animal brain and one dependent on a human brain have different ranges of objects they can know. Due to the complexity of the brain of these two beings, the mental faculties and consciousness depending on them differ in what they can perceive and understand. So right now we are speaking of the perceiving capability of the mind and how there can be so many obstructions in the way of what it can see and cannot see. So but uh, even on this also I sometimes think how could I, I sometimes think of uh, the, the condition of animals like that of athletic person in, uh, in astronauts here. <laughs> An athletic person who, uh, instead of going to Olympics, has chosen to go to the moon and have gone through all the trainings, now he is, or she is, fully in the astronaut's gear. Now ask him or her to run or do the aerobics. They will not be able to do it, let, let alone doing it. They will be able to hardly walk. <laughs> so in terms of mind, having gone any down or not, I, I, I doubt. <laughs> it could be just, it has not the 
physical me mechanism for, uh, for outlet. And sometimes, sometimes, and these days, because of the social media, we can see animals doing so many different things. <laughs> uh, almost like calculating. I personally saw one, one time grow. I mean, we have an understanding. I don't know how, to, how much truth there is in it. But among the Tibetans, we say the crows, they think of themselves as very smart, and they would uh, store bones or breads that they get for the next day. And how do they mark it? They will mark it by looking at the cloud. You put it here and then say, okay, under, under that cloud, I put it. <laughs> Tomorrow I will go under that cloud and then I'll find it. The cloud is gone. But I have, I have actually seen a crow do this. Instead of eating it, kind of really stacking it within, within, within this shape, kind of a V-shaped uh, tree branch, and then kind of constantly look like this, like this. and then eventually <laughs> making sure, and then leaving it there and then going away. And, and then due to the social media, uh, we could see how some so strange things that animals do, almost like thinking. I once saw a bear on the way of nowhere, where, uh, what, do you, what do you call them? On the road, you, you put signposts. Uh, what do you call them? The cone, 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 pardon? Yeah, yeah, cone, conical, cones, right? Okay, cones. It was thrown down. A, a bear just happens to walk by and then put it back. <laughs> What in the world he or she has to do with the cone falling down? Why worry? <laughs> At least she knows that, oh, that's not the way. That's not the right way for a cone to be. It just puts back and, and then goes on its way. <laughs> so I kind of sometimes doubt that the, the, the capacity of the mind, capacity of the mind could not be as, yeah, any less, except the, the 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 mechanism for expression, expressing it is now not there. It's kind of, I mean, I mean the the make of the physical outfit, the physical physical body is different, and 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 also uh, it lets, and because of that, it is limiting on what. The, uh, being can and cannot do. So say if you have not the same kind of memory neurons in you, then you will not be able to remember as much. But if you put, if they have, if they have that, or if you could replace their brain with the human brain, I think something interesting could happen. <laughs> so, 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 as much as we may connect mind with the brain, and particularly it's true with those with brain, that their mental, gross mental factors, men, minds are definitely expressing through the brain and thus affected with it. But in terms of kind of uh, identifying them as one and the same thing, or being the, or, 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 or that, the mind itself is very different in these different species. I kind of doubt, at least given with this perspective, I think the, the reason why they are less, if at all, less smart, less remembering of things and whatnot, it may have to do with what kind of a body they have, how constraining it is. Anyway, furthermore, a mind proliferating with wrong views and overwhelmed with disturbing emotions 
is too distracted and preoccupied to turn its attention to other objects. Yeah, the mind's capability of seeing things, being aware of things, could be hindered by so many ways, right? Not just uh, our physical uh, faculties and physical uh, conditions, but our own mental elements of what we allow in, what we allow into, allow it to the surface of the mind, what we give in to, or what we invest in, in terms of wrong views and other disturbing emotions, to that extent, uh, they would have that same effect of uh, limiting the mind's capability of seeing things. Not just limiting the mind's capability of seeing things rightly, correctly, but even projecting wrong lenses before it. <laughs> <laughs> it, pro but it, it projects or it kind of, pro what do you call, puts in place wrong lenses before the eye. <laughs> it sees through that lens and thus what it sees is completely mistaken. The range of what such afflicted mental states can know becomes very limited. A calm mind can be more astute. Basically, His Holiness and Venerable are making the point that despite these obstructions which come in the way of the mind's capability of seeing and perceiving things or not, the mind's fundamental potential cannot be compromised. And if that could be understood and recognized and, uh, and developed, cultivated, one could uh, overcome many of these obstructions, particularly the mental obstructions. But then eventually it could be developed to such a, such a state of being where, you, where no material things can ever be a hindrance to see through it. Did I share with you when I was in, I think I did, I did it, but it wouldn't hurt to share again in summer at Depung during summer science intensive when I was translating for a neuroscience class we were talking about language and concept and consciousness yeah there was the sixth year where we were talking about consciousness consciousness mind subconsciousness and unconscious all of those <laughs> and how they were making the case that Concept or conceptual thought. Concept, conceptual thought is all we have. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't be able to get by. Right at that time, I was translating it to the monks, but at the same time, what was going through me was, oh, that means Buddhas don't get by. <laughs> Buddhas will be completely lost. How would they be a refuge to us? They would be rather depending on us to be led through the mount to through the monastery and shown the class saying, This is the class. And now two, three, two steps more. Now it is <laughs> So that's the reason why I was making this case that in the Buddhist psychology, conceptual thoughts, although we begin with conceptual thoughts, say in the case of understanding emptiness. And, and we refine it, refine it, even while being in the conceptual state, we can refine it almost like what you call pulling off layers of curtains over a window. Right? Eventually you are left with just one singular transparent layer. Uh, 
curtain. And then when to the point, almost like it's equal to having no no trans no 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 curtain at all. And when even that is revealed, then you would see the object unmediated by the curtains as before. So so likewise in Buddhism, in the Buddhist psychology, we speak of this in a very, very explicit way when we when we recite the Ha Sutra Mantra Tayata Gate Gate. Gate Gate are the conceptual levels. Paragate is the first level of non conceptual direct perception of emptiness. And then from then on it is not just paragate, but good, good gade. <laughs> paragate, parasam gade, bodhisattva. It keeps on improving, right? So, so, as Buddhists, uh, we have a responsibility to practice. That's so strange, I, I say this. Uh, not just for our own sake, but also for the sake of others. And that could include um, contributing to the Dharma itself, as a service to the Dharma, in making in testifying to the truth of the Dharma by being a testimony to it through one's own practice. And one way of doing it, which is far overdue, I think, is of this possibility of mentally seeing something directly. So far, all we know within the scientists, all we know of mental states is mental conceptual thoughts. Everything that we know as mental is mental conceptual thoughts. Dream, memory, re everything. Reflection, contemplating, calculating, planning, conspiring, everything. All are conceptual thoughts. So this, so the in sense of non-conceptual thought within the mental realm is, is not that accessible uh, to a scientific research. Although it's not that we depend on scientific research to confirm what we believe in or not, but at the same time, it would be a great service to the Dharma as well as to the humanity in bringing new knowledge. For those who value knowledge over everything, it's great contribution. Like in, in, in the West, the entire discipline of philosophy is for knowledge, right? Knowledge drives them. And having a knowledge is the greatest achievement, greatest goal. So we could be contributing to a new knowledge on, a, on, on the scientific, in the scientific world, and that could lead, lead to more knowledge, more possibilities, but not. At the same time, to our own fellow practitioners also, that could be very, very encouraging. We need to see live examples. I think when it comes to developing the mind's quality, don't be content. That's the reason why be content is only there at where we serve food. <laughs> Not every time in front of us. So when it comes to developing the mind, we don't need to be content. 
Right? Because there is no worry that the mind's capacity will be used up, would uh, exhaust. No, mind can be developed. And, quote unquote, infinitely. Whereas physical resources are limited, mental resources, the mental capacity is not limited. So I think we have a, I think His Holiness makes these calls quite often, quite often. At the time of Buddha and even to this time in countries like Burma and others, not as many as it, they used to be, but even today, they have people that they can point to as arhats. Likewise, it would be good to have, say, oh, he's a Jolampa, he is on the path of accumulation, he's on the path of, she's on the path of preparation, or she is already on the path of seeing, or someone is on the path of meditation. By the way, med the path of meditation, why it is called the path of meditation? It, there may be other reasons. One reason is to suggest that one, that one has to spend long time in meditation. That's the reason why it is called meditation, path of meditation. All the rest are also part of meditation as well. <laughs> they are generated to, through meditation, but that specific one is called part of meditation. And it has, meditation has a connotation of familiarization of an extended process. And I did come across even a text saying that Yu Ringbur Kompe Lam means meditating, the path of meditation which has been undertaken for long. So, if you could call someone being on the path of meditation, or someone who has, who has genuine, great compassion, bodhicitta. Yeah, I was working on the 108 places of compassion. Now we are finished. It's, it's already um, not just co-edited, but what do you call when three people are involved in the edition? <laughs> it's still co-edited, co-edited by three people. <laughs> so, so there it says, people may be able to fake of their other attainments, but when it comes to compassion, you cannot fake. You cannot even fake having it unless you have it. <laughs> but we need live examples of them. Right, uh, and be able to kind of uh, share it with the world, uh, and also be open to uh, scientific researches where the conditions are acceptable. So, in science, they do not make this case at all. The case of this. This trans, this trans, transformation or trans, ne yurba. It's almost like transmutation. In Tibetan, we use the term ne yurba. Ne yurba means it's self. Ne yurba means, say, in the case of anger, jealousy, greed, in the Chittamatra uh, understanding. Chittamanta system, there is a clear uh, explanation of how even the afflictions. Now, I want to use this term flip, flip, flip off into becoming path. It's like the same material, the same substance, same continuum of the affliction now becoming uh, path. In, 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 in a sense that the 
the that it only sheds uh, away the affliction part of it, and it, and its continuum is then now uh, taken on a positive virtuous form. Yeah, there was a reason why I was choosing the term transmutation. Transmutation suggests some some form of change required, yet at the same time, not completely. Uh, what do you call it? replacing the entire uh, element of it? So. I think I shared it with you also in in a sutra called Re, at the request of Kashyapa in the chapter requested by Kashyapa or, or yeah in, in, the, in the chapter requested by Kashyapa there Buddha himself uh, volunteers in he was I think somebody asks the question or he he kind of uh, brings up this question, seeing how is it possible uh, for conceptual thoughts to become, to eventually transmute into non-conceptual direct perception. While conceptions are to be fully, totally shunned and abandoned, uh, including the positive conceptions, conceptual thoughts. At the state of Buddha, there is no conceptual thoughts. It's only perceptual minds. All sense consciousnesses are perceptual, naturally. Uh, but at the same time, Buddha's mind, all of his love, compassion, bodhicitta, wisdom, understanding, emptiness, all of those, including other qualities, etc., all of those which are mental are all perceptual in nature. Right? So the question was, how come? How could this happen? How could abstraction lead to? How, how, how can an abstraction, which is conceptual thought, lead to full awakening in, 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 in the form of non-conceptual thought? Buddha gives this example of the twigs. When rubbed together, they burn themselves. Right? Likewise, con the conceptual thought, say in a conceptual understanding of emptiness, when it is contemplated upon, meditated upon, uh, consistently, eventually it loses not its object of emptiness, rather it sharpens its understanding of it, but in the course of doing so, it loses or it sheds off its conceptual uh, it's, it's conceptual, uh, con conceptual layers. It's conceptuality, conceptuality, uh, bit by bit, so much so that eventually it will be at the bordering of non-conceptual thought that they would be almost identical, and then eventually it would completely, be, completely be transformed into or, or transmuted into non-conceptual thought. So he says that by using conceptual thoughts, by using conceptual thoughts, by the means of conceptual thoughts being meditated upon consistently with, say, emptiness or something, as an object to be focused on and developing clarity, focus, attention, all of those. That process, when sustained, eventually leads to the thinning out of the conceptuality of it, of the subjective agent, and eventually almost shedding its conceptual heat and coming out as non-conceptual perceptual understanding. So he uses, uses this example. This is very uh, important because uh, there are many uh, Buddhist uh, 
I don't know schools, but individuals or uh, traditions which consider conceptual thoughts, no matter what, virtuous and non virtuous, as obstacles. That even uh, contemplating on emptiness or even having a thought generated and sustained is considered to be in fact cultivating an obstacle to full awakening or full full flourishing in which case then the process of development through the paths would have to be kind of uh, left to mere mystery or saying that those are unexplainable kind of uh, look for an easy way out whereas in the tradition of John Fongkapa he really to the extent possible he pushes the boundaries of thoughts and thinking capacity in really coming up with a coherent understanding of things and uh, and that would include making this case of how the trans the progress from second gati to the paragati is possible that we do not want to stop at the second gate although that's <laughs> Because we have already come to the second gate now, we have to, to done almost the most difficult work in terms of requiring efforts. Now we have, by that time, we would have become so used and so familiarized with things that now what would be normally considered very difficult would come off very easily. Not because they have become easy, but because of the strength, the force of love, love, compassion, wisdom, etc. Because of them, now relative to them, what, what would be difficult would have now become so easy. Yet at the same time, one earns the merit as much because those are acts out of a strong wealth of love, compassion, bodhicitta, like that. And those are the elements that counts in what uh, gives rise to merits. So it's like, as we move on the path, it becomes easier, yet at the same time, be able to do harder things. Yet, at the same time, ironically, or paradoxically, earn more merit. So, definitely we do not want to stop at the second gate. Once we have there, then we should wave to each other and say, "Come on, let's go! Don't, don't stay." <laughs> oh, anyway, I just wanted to point it out. A further difficulty in knowing objects is that some objects are so subtle, profound, or vast, uh, or vast, that the ordinary mind is unable to cognize them. To know these objects, single-pointed concentration or and or wisdom that is freed from wrong conceptions is needed. Do you have any idea what, what objects would this be like? A further difficulty in knowing objects is that some objects are so subtle, profound or vast that the ordinary mind is unable to cognize them. Pardon? Settle impermanence and emptiness. How come an ordinary man, mind can understand emptiness? Settle, em, settle impermanence. The, yeah, or ordinary people can. In the. Hmm, oh, yeah, they can cognize. I mean, inferentially. Conceptually, they can cognize ordinary beings can. Yeah, and then in the case of emptiness, uh, impermanence, ordinary beings can even see them 
uh, directly also. Yes, please. Maybe when it says ordinary mind, it, it just means like ordinary people rather than non-aryas, as in the Tibetan or the Buddhist sense. Yeah. The term ordinary here just refers to just everyday people. Yes, yes, yes. Even given that also, even given that also, they, they can be people ordinary, counted as ordinary, or maybe you wouldn't count them as ordinary anymore. Even if they have not uh, landed on any path, so would you would you include them as ordinary here or not? Maybe not. If yeah, if a anyone that is not on the path is ordinary, although we sometimes we usually uh, include those even on the path of accumulation and preparation to be ordinary, but. If we leave them aside, and then those count among those who have not yet landed on the path, but yet still striving, and have succeeded in understanding emptiness, that that is possible. Let alone that, and before that, they can generate uh, great compassion in others also. But maybe I'm. Taking it out of context, ordinary here means someone who is totally, completely uh, not informed at all, let alone practicing it. So in that sense, yeah, but at the same time, there can be things that can be very difficult for even advanced practitioners to see, something that only Buddhists can see, right? So the subtle working of karma, etc., etc., are something that are only the purview, the purview of the Buddhas. And the mind of Buddha is also one of them. There was a question, question about what might be the Buddha's reason behind uh, laying out, laying down the eight Garu Dhammas. I stop short of saying only mind, only Buddha can know a Buddha's mind. <laughs> but I did say that the no no tripitakata tripitakas carry any explication explication on what was the reason or the thought behind it because that would mean what Buddha thought behind. So. So. If that is the case, then coming up with one guess or the other would be mere at the best uh, speculation. But I, I first included only Buddha's, Buddha can know a Buddha mind. I took it away. Yeah, so there can be so many things that are so subtle that even high advanced uh, beings cannot understand. So here, from a Buddhist perspective, we are speaking of how the subtle, subtle propensities, subtle traces of self-grasping, or, uh, yeah, self-grasping, or grasping at independent existence, not a manifest mental state of it, but set, settled, very subtle trace of it uh, can stand in way of uh, knowing everything. So I, th I sometimes have um, experimented it with being contrived to be very clear in mind, yet at the same time, kind of clearly. Mm, intentionally think of it as think of intentionally buying into how things appear to be existing in that really existent and and wondering how could that uh, keep me from being from from understanding from seeing things uh, including being fully omniscient uh, one thing is you're intentionally projecting or buying into 
the misconception. So that itself is uh, an obstruction. But not counting that, even not counting that, uh, I could sometimes, I think, I think uh, we could make sense of how buying to such a st uh, state of such a notion uh, could stand in the way of knowing the reality because we would be freezing things and kind of uh, into their very fixed, clear-cut uh, identities. Whereas in re reality, things are not that uh, solid, clear-cut, concrete. They are all almost like uh, fluid and relational, not, not kind of a static identities and buying to that kind of a notion, wrong notion, can keep us from seeing much, much, much of the realities. So anyway, yeah, it, 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 we should give, give a thought and try to make a sense of how, how among everything, among all, all things, all we are left with is just the bhakta of the afflictions as a, of cognitive obscuration. How, but it's almost like a single type of object, right? Single, single, just single type. There are no other things other than the bhakta, so the nyamungs, as the obs cognitive obscuration. Yet at the same time, it makes a, it makes uh, such a big difference in uh, w w what one is capable of. So that's that's what uh, made me wonder sometimes, and and then come up with some experiments and making sense of it. How could that be in a, a cognitive excavation? How in among so many things there could be uh, how that could this would be the only single thing out uh, that can be the, so. That can, that can be the cognitive obscuration that can keep us from becoming fully awakened. And, uh, yeah, it's something to be thought about and make sense of. Okay. So I think we have read through that. A further difficulty in knowing objects is, this, is that some objects are so subtle profound or vast, that the ordinary mind is unable to cognize them. To know these objects, single-pointed concentration and or wisdom that is freed from wrong conceptions is needed. So wisdom freed from wrong conceptions. I mean, even within that also we can speak of say several levels of them, but if we speak of wisdom completely free from any wrong conceptions whatsoever, then we are speaking of the mind or the wisdom of the Buddha. Even without that also, sometimes single-pointed concentrations could open us to new insights of what the mind's capacity is, capabilities. Sometimes uh, the positive, the, the Potentials of mind can be, can be mm, assessed or can be inferred from people taking, mm, what do you call them? What's the term? Yes, I know one name. Uh, silo, silo How I got into that, I, let me tell you. <laughs> Once I shared it, now I have to clear it. <laughs> Again, I was in the summer science in intensive, and it coincided with uh, study abroad students from Emory and other universities. So, in the course of their their program going parallel with this monk's science program. Uh, each one of them or a group of them were given project. So one guy was doing a project on the 
what the Buddhist take would be, how it it's uh, how it conflicts with, with these phenomena of psychedelics. Uh, could it be uh, useful, uh, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So he he gave me a book and said, at the very least, read from this page to this page, and I'll come to you with questions. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me, he gave me uh, assignment. <laughs> I said, okay, that's so good. So I went through it. Oh, at the very least, it points out to what mind is capable of. Things we speak of in the scriptures of what the Bodhisattva can see, can do, can is able to overcome, etc particularly supported by their own, uh, the Bodhisattva's own cultivation of love, compassion. I mean, really kind of scaffolding it from so all the, all the sites, right? Be that from the method. Uh, and then, yes, we can see, yes, how it can be possible to give rise to a structure with all that scaffolding happening from all sides. So it becomes easier to say when you have such cases of people are, of course, out of control and could be very, very risky, but yet at the same time it opens to a whole new possibility of what mind can see, can do. They're trying their best to kind of harness this phenomena and kind of bring it under control and utilize it in a, in a healthy way in the medical science and whatnot, but I don't know uh, where, they are, where they have gotten. But uh, the fact that this is possible is, 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 is open. Yeah, so, 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 so long as they do not uh, reach arrive at a point where they can really control where this where the experience is going to lead or then it is not safe to take that <laughs> because even by taking it individuals would have different experiences some could be very fatal would have totally different perception of something there like a live thing but completely Baloney to others, right? Complete baloney. I learned this word in Knoxville. <laughs> <laughs> so I even have locations tagged with words. <laughs> Get a vampire <wimples> here. <laughs> okay. So these are things that can point to how, what. The mind's capacity is really infinite, infinite. So he was very curious in asking me, what, what, what's the Buddhist take? Do Buddhists ever re resort to this or not? Some Indian religions do that. They have a time when they, they, they take hashish and all that, right? Uh, but in, in Buddhism, resorting to such incense, sub sub substances to induce certain experiences is, is not recommended at all, and uh, not advocated at all, because they would be only full, only kind of subjecting you oneself to an external thing. It wouldn't be something owned by you. Whereas what we are trying to do is trying to cultivate our mind within our control, and so that we can reach the state of kind of being able to call them when we need them. Push them aside when we don't. <laughs> okay, so on a new board, uh, should we have a question and answer session here? Yeah, so before that, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. So people online also, please feel free to uh, Write in your questions if you have. Otherwise, just reading the text, unless uh, I remember to 
mm. spice it up with some stories from here and there it could be boring <laughs> so <laughs> Gisela last week you said self-grasping which is an aff affliction needs to be identified clearly so that we can make a distinction between self-cherishing and self-centeredness please explain how we can clearly identify self-grasping and how to make a distinction between self-cherishing and self-centeredness <laughs> there are three 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 selfies <laughs> One is self-centeredness, one is self-cherishing, self and the other is self-grasping. So, um, when I was speaking up, uh, making a distinction between self-cherishing and self-centeredness, that has mainly to do with the English, how it conveys to an English a speaker in the English culture. Uh, because if we say self cherishing and self centeredness are same, then while at the same time we bash self centeredness, we don't want to bash self cherishing. We want to cherish oneself in the sense of taking care of oneself to the extent we can while we do not come in the way of others and while we can do not come in the way of others or do not harm others or, right, or prioritize ourselves over others. Self-centeredness in the way it is uh, Conveyed here as Lang Chen Zin uh, is prioritizing oneself over others. To put it clearly, prioritizing oneself over others. So watch for the tendencies of saying, I'll first do this for myself, then I will come. Those kind of tendencies, unless it is unavoidable. That would be a case of self-centeredness. Though not that harmful, but nonetheless, that could make us stronger in our habit of self-centeredness. Not so much of a problem from an individual liberation seeker point of view, but from a Bodhisattva aspirant, it is a big problem. That could snowball into a a big stumbling block before oneself and can keep bodhicitta from flourishing at all. So prioritizing oneself over others is how I would uh, define self-centeredness. Self-cherishing is taking care of oneself while at the same time not prioritizing. And self-grasping, for the lack of better way of calling it, because it is a direct translation from Tibetan, but I, I don't know if it came through, across in the translation, in Kishi Shitapkela's explanation, he, while referring to what we are calling self-grasping, in Tibetan Tangzin, he made the case that this here, ta, ta, ta is not self, self as person, but ta nyi, ta nyi, which means nature, identity. So he, that's the first time I have heard being expanded this that way. Ta uh, nyi, Zimba. So, holding on to an identity, not necessarily saying self-identity, but holding on to an identity, Tani, holding on to a totally mistaken identity, amounting to seeing it as inherently existent. 
otherwise self grasping uh, for uh, for a new person it would seem like grasping at ego grasping at i whereas when used in the prasangika prasangika madhyamika uh, context particularly particularly uh, speaking of the subtle self grasping or subtle tangsin then there the self is definitely not self as a person but self as a identity so identity grasping or or you could say a grasping at selfhood totally unfounded selfhood and in the sense of identity but when we speak of uh, grosser self grasping tangzin tara subtle and gross when we speak of grosser self grasping there the self is person self as a person but not in the context of the subtle self grasping so that's why i i have difficulty using it wondering what might be coming across unless uh explained so mm, yeah so i have I, i have tried to identify self grasping here in this context which means grasping at a notion a notion amounting to inherent existent grasping at a wrong nature amounting to having inherent existent existence that's self grasping and self cherishing and self centeredness uh if somebody asks this question and i have to explain it to tibetan then I, my answer will be different <laughs> like you hear his holiness advocating saying uh in in the west that anger could be sometimes positive while hatred cannot be right but when he speaks to tibetan if he uses the term kongdo for anger then he wouldn't be speaking speaking of anger in those terms to the tibetans and that speaks of his being very present on the, of the context so definitely in the western psychology you wouldn't say anger and hatred are same you wouldn't say at all at the most you could say anger could grow into hatred but not anger by itself is equal i mean equivalent to hatred whereas in tibetan kongdo and shatang are interchangeable so yeah otherwise why i'm saying this is in our lamanchoba lamanchoba text uh i don't remember how it is translated but the tibetan term is ranin chenji kubakunji ko manam chenji yonden kunji shi the subject part of it is self and others right the the action part of it is chenjin the same term chenjin rangi chenjin means self cherishing manam chenjin means i'm using the same term chenjin right manam chenjin means cherishing the mother sentient beings so they have been juxtaposed as the opposite so if one wants to be very very faithful in translation then one would have to be saying self cherishing is the root of all problems other cherishing is the root of all qualities but in english that could convey wrong message mm-hmm. 
But at the same time, the arhats or the shirvakas training on their paths to become arhats, when they cherish, when they aspire to attain liberation for themselves, that is considered limiting. Though it is not a suffering, nor is it a obstruction, nor is it a negative thing, yet at the same time it has its own constraints from the eyes of the Bodhisattva. And a very, very, what do you call, mm, mm, it's, con it's considered uh, very to toxic for the Bodhisattvas. The only toxin that they really, really emphasize on and focus on is the one that is just the opposite of cherishing others. Okay, that's the first question. <laughs> How do we understand when His Holiness talks about, you know, he's looking forward to either, sometimes he says the path of preparation, sometimes mm -hmm. he says the path of seeing. Do, do we take that literally that he's... I think we can all do our own different ways of reading it. How I do it is, I mean, I see that as an activity of the Buddha. He, over the times, had not only shared with us, but has uh, under, kind of shown in his own person the gradual growth. And that's the only way he could inspire us. And he would share how at one point he would rather be a hut and take a big slumber, <laughs> long slumber, but then even but was very much uh, taken in by emptiness and was seeing the possibility of attaining liberation and thus be able to treat himself to a long worryless slumber. But then eventually coming after coming into exact how he concentrated on Bodhicitta mainly through Shantideva's text by receiving transmission of it, not just transmission, explanation, very detailed explanation from Kunu Lama Rinpoche. Kunu Lama Tenzin Jansen, an Indian from Kunu, who was very well versed in Sanskrit and was able to really point out how Tibetan texts we were using could be slightly tweaked this way and this way to better convey the original Sanskrit. So it's very interesting to hear His Holiness share those things, he has noted them on the text and he shares them. It would be good to kind of either in some way incorporate that in the public public publication of a new uh, Bodhisattva even Tibetan, or, or at least make a note that this is where Kundalama Rinpoche aspires, or in a note, suggests this. So, so he has shared his, his personal growth, personal journey, and now maybe it's, it's the right time to say, at the very least, that the path of preparation, path of accumulation, and then it will, it, I, uh, how I take it is, it may have to do with who are the listeners at that time. We have something called Chetujave Duja. There could be so many listening, but someone for whom it is specifically meant to be. So he could be addressing them. So 
that's how we hear him switch from one path to the other, right? Yeah. But I, I kind of generally think of that as a compassionate act. As a, yeah, His Holiness, again, in, yeah, I, I kind of see that as a compassionate act. Yeah, as a way of well, giving us encouragement. And, and there is one message where he is, His Holiness says that, yes, the best gift to my, for my birth, on my birthday is being compassionate. Do cultivate compassion, that would be the best gift to me. And he says that this, uh, this statement I'm making is not an empty word. It's rooted in my own experience. I have practiced it and I have seen the result of it, benefits of it. That's why from that place I'm saying with confidence that yes, cultivate compassion, that will be the best gift to me. And that's so typical of what a Buddha, a Bodhisattva would say. Because all they care is the benefit of others. And for the benefit of others, if they cultivate compassion, they will benefit. And benefit in a very, very, th what do you call, uh, uh, definite sense. That's very typical Bodhisattva. You do this, because all I cherish is your well-being. And how, what would contribute to your well-being is, if you cultivate, if you get this message, if you get that, can, 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 Cultivating compassion, not giving in to hatred, is the way. And he has, so, so he takes his birthday as an opportunity uh, to kind of get that message in a different way. Saying, give me a gift. Do give me a gift if you want by cultivating compassion. And he says that this is not an empty chatter, empty word, but grounded in my own experience. And that's so typical, so typical. Like we heard last time from that sutra where Buddha was saying, I share, I mean, I said the term pain, the pain might be a little too strong a word, but I share in the suffering and the joy of sentient beings uh, in the sense that he does get, he or she, a Bodhisattva, a Buddha, genuinely caring for others would definitely get disappointed when those who aspire to follow them act that way. So likewise, I think uh, I see this as a very uh, typical Bodhisattva or Buddha activity. Okay, we will dedicate.